I'm very excited to introduce both of our speakers today, give you a little bit of background information. Um, Dr. Tyler Leeson is a curator of vertebrate paleontology at the DMNS, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He's responsible for the fossil reptiles collection. His research focuses on the early origin and evolution of reptiles, particularly turtles, as well as the drivers and tempo of the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction and subsequent ecosystem recovery. He's working on projects in the Denver Basin in Colorado, Williston Basin in North Dakota and Montana, and the Karoo Basin in South Africa. Leeson received his PhD and master's in geology and paleontology from Yale University and his bachelor's from Swarthmore College. Leeson was a postdoctoral researcher at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History before joining the museum in the Denver Museum in 2014. Welcome, Tyler. We're so excited to have you. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Ian Miller. Ian is the curator of paleobotany and director of Earth and Space Sciences at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. In addition to running the Earth and Space Sciences departments, he is in charge of the world-class collection of fossil plants at the museum. His research focuses on fossil leaves and their applications for understanding ancient ecosystems and climate. He is presently working on projects in the Colorado Rockies along the Colorado Front Range, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah, the San Juan Basin in New Mexico, the Williston Basin in North Dakota, and the Morandova Basin in Madagascar. Thank you both so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to pass it over to you. Thank you, Meg, and thank you for having us. It's so exciting to be here. This is a thrill for us to get to um, present uh, to another museum. Often we're presenting to all kinds of uh, groups, including universities and colleges, and then lots of uh, community groups. But it's not often that we get to speak directly to another museum, and it's, it's a thrill for us. We're passionate about museums and their role in our communities and our society. And, uh, it's really a thrill to um, be able to uh, give this talk for all of you. Um, my background, just for reference, is the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, uh, where we do a lot of our research. And even though it's not on Tyler's list, he works out there as well, uh, which is really cool. So, uh, but today we're, we're really thrilled to tell you this story of discovery and science right in the backyard of Colorado Springs. It's a, it's a remarkable, uh, it's it's just a remarkable story at the end of the day. And just to give you some perspective of how, how what the level of interest is around the world around this, we'll, we'll have some anecdotes through the through the talk. But uh, this evening, Tyler and I are presenting to as many as a thousand people in India um, on this very topic. Uh, they really want to know what's what's happening over here, and it's really has a global impact. So to kick this off, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Okay, do you guys see that? Yes. Any, uh, Tyler, yes? Yes. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so uh, our talk today is, is titled Rise of the Mammals, and that's probably what you saw, and we love this uh, um, s sort of subtitle, Colorado Discovery Rock the World. So to, to start, we're, Tyler and I are going to bounce back and forth on this talk and each give uh, two different segments on the story and, and um, sum up with where we are today. But I really want to start by setting the stage for this and why this is so important. So uh, this slide right here uh, to start shows um, the, the history of diversity of life over the last 600 million years. Basically, since sort of the accepted date for the origin of multicellular life. Uh, there's some squish around that, but suffice it to say 600 million is typically the date used. And what you see along the bottom axis is time from about 600 million years ago to the present day. And what you see along the vertical axis, the up and down axis, is the number of families of animals. Um, we're just looking at animals here, uh, but it's just a proxy for diversity. Right, so you start 600 million years ago and you can see that there's an overall trend from then until the present day of increasing diversity, more different types of things as, as life diversifies. And the color coding is related to some of these large groupings. We sort of think of some weird groups of animals as being these very old uh, Cambrian fauna or the Paleozoic fauna, which 
even persists to the present day. And then the modern fauna being that light yellow color. But what I really want you to focus on is that jagged pattern that it forms. And every time you see, you see a rise in, so maybe you can see my cursor, or you can see a rise here, this is diversification. And anytime you see a sawtooth pattern here, that's one of the great mass extinctions in Earth's history. And there are five recognized great, five recognized mass extinctions. They are all great, if you will. Um, and a mass extinction simply means that over a short period of time, at least 50% of the species on Earth go extinct. And that's what qualifies for a mass extinction. So there have been five of these. The last mass extinction is the end of the Cretaceous. And that, of course, that sawtooth right there is the end of the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and you might say that sawtooth is not 50% of that graph, but remember it's species, not family. So as you get higher up on that hierarchy, uh, there's less effect uh, to the taxonomic uh, uh, groups. But 50% of the species go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. So when you think of a mass extinction, I, I want you to think of two different uh, aspects of it. Certainly in our minds, we, have, we usually have down pat the idea of extinction. So on the left-hand side there, there's a branching tree of life. Um, and the, those branches revert, the, just represent diversity. So they, um, they can be different lifestyles, different species, different families, whatever it might be. And that branching tree of diversity um, slams up against some kind of mass extinction event. And there are many different causes. But that mass extinction event sort of trims that tree. It's a filter. It's a filter for life at that moment. And then, of course, we know that, of course, there's still a lot of life on Earth today. So some things do make it through these extinctions. And you can see a few of those branches making it through. Once they make it through, they diversify in that world that's sort of devoid of competition. And this is a very, very, very interesting time in, life's, in the history of life on Earth. After each of these mass extinctions, there's a very interesting period where the, the life that is lucky enough to survive, for whatever reason, diversifies all over the world. So not only do I want you to think of an extinction, an extinction event as a filter, but I also want you to think of it as a moment of origins. So um, just to put a little bit finer point on that, uh, here's just a nice little slide showing the diversity of life on Earth today. And what you can see is that um, uh, a, basically a picture representing each major group that's alive uh, on the planet. And when you look out your window, if you look out your window right now, everything that's living on the landscape had to have an ancestor that survived the last mass extinction, that survived the extinction of the dinosaurs. So the birds, all the plants that we see on the planet, of course the tens of millions of insect species, the fishes, the reptiles, uh, the fungi, and of course our group of animals, the mammals, all have survivors, uh, we all have ancestors that survived the last great mass extinction. So the very flora and fauna out your window is shaped by the last mass extinction. So what happened? So you guys probably have a, uh, at least a general sense of what happened, um, but uh, 66 million years ago, we were hit by a space rock, an asteroid, a very large one, uh, probably close to 10 miles across, uh, well, 10 kilometers across, about six miles, six, eight miles across, moving at about 150,000 kilometers an hour. We think it came in from the south uh, based on the crater, and it flew over Antarctica and South America and hit the Yucatan, what is now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, um, with enough force to pull outer space right to the surface of the planet. And this 10 kilometer wide piece of rock blew a hole in the ground about 20 to 25 kilometers deep and about 180 to 200 kilometers across, a huge hole. And it was so powerful that it actually was like dropping a stone in water. It liquefied the surface of the earth and sent a shock wave and firestorm let's see here, from Mexico to Alaska in about five minutes. So this is a scene that you might expect right here in Colorado with the firestorm moments after the impact um, about to incinerate uh, these two famous dinosaurs, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops, both alive then at the end of the Cretaceous. And Tyler and I always laugh at this figure because in this artist's rendition, they're still pretty preoccupied with themselves instead of that firestorm coming right at them. So this firestorm 
incinerates probably our side of the planet. Um, and it's followed by shockwave or this immense shockwave, but also earthquakes and tsunamis. There are blocks of rock the size of cars in Haiti, which is um, about 700, 800 kilometers from the impact site. And this, is, this all happens in mere moments after the impact. But about a day later, uh, something very insidu insidu insidious happens. All the material that was blasted out of the hole has gone into orbit around the Earth, or actually suborbit, and starts raining back within about 24 hours. And when it does that, it superheats the atmosphere. And so let's say you survive the impact, and maybe you were in New Zealand and you survived the impact. 24 hours later, you're getting blanketed in molten rock. And that, that superheated the atmosphere to several hundred degrees Fahrenheit, probably about the temperature it takes to bake cookies in your oven. And uh, that was maybe the most important killing mechanism. And uh, so basically, if you were on land, uh, out of the water, and out of a hole and you were breathing this air, it probably killed you. So um, that, and there's a whole slew of environmental impacts that last for decades to centuries, serve to disrupt life such that uh, the all sort of dominant and powerful dinosaur, which had dominated the earth for some 150 million years, goes extinct. And this little artist rendition uh, gives you a clue to what happened afterwards. So here's um, uh, a dinosaur skeleton on the landscape and a few mammals crawling all over it. And those mammals, um, though making it through the extinction, almost themselves blink out. We know now that about 80% of mammals go extinct at the boundary. So our group of animals barely make it through, but we do, into that new world that has all kinds of room to, di to diver diversify. So, um, when you think of it from the rock record, this is a fun a little illustration from a Nova special that Tyler was in a number of years ago. And there are teams of, of people on that landscape digging dinosaurs. And this is in his backyard. He grew up in an area that's packed full of dinosaurs in, in uh, North Dakota. And those ghostly figures below that line are all representations of the dinosaurs we find right at the end of the time of the dinosaur kingdom, if you will the dinosaur world, um, right at the end of the time of the Cretaceous. And they go up, those skeletons go right up to that line. And above that line, we have never found anywhere on Earth an articulated dinosaur skeleton. And in fact, we find very, very few fossils. But if you wanted to answer this question of what happened after the boundary, you know, who survived and how did they evolve in those early years after the boundary, you'd want to find fossils up on top of that hill. And yet there are so precious few. So Tyler and I really wanted to say something or have an impact on this, this problem. Many paleontologists uh, before us also want to have, you know, want to have something to say about what happened afterwards. And um, uh, Tyler came to the museum about five or six years ago. I had been there a few years prior to that. And we teamed up thinking about this problem. We both worked on the KT boundary or the, or the end of the time of the dinosaurs. But we really wanted to see if we could shed some light on the time afterwards. And so we rolled out the maps and started looking around the world where we could go. And uh, there are sections that have the KT boundary, the end of the dinosaurs, and the time after. And uh, they are in far fun places like Bolivia and, and, and so on and so forth. But it turns out here in North America, it's also here. So we have the boundary well preserved and we have the time afterwards. We just didn't really have many much in the way of fossils in the time afterwards. But before you buy those plane tickets and fly around the world and run an expedition somewhere else, it's always good to go back and check uh, the rocks that are in your backyard, even if somebody had been walking over them or people, paleontologists have been walking over them uh, for as much as 100 years. And so that brings us to this photo right here, which is a beautiful photo of Corral Bluffs looking towards the west, that's Pikes Peak there, um, uh, behind the rain and in the sun. And this, uh, we came back to Corral Bluffs, even though people had been there before, and started looking for fossils to see if we could see it in a little bit different way. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Tyler to take it from here. Okay. Oh, I'm going to stop sharing, I suppose. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> So yeah, my name's Tyler, and again, I'm just really excited to be here to be able to share this wonderful discovery with everybody. Uh, can everybody see that, Ian? Yes, I can see it. 
Okay, well, great. So, yes, yeah, so we landed ahead, you know, Colorado Springs and, you know, or, or Corral Bluffs because it was, you know, it really is your backyard. But I mean, being at the Denver Museum, it's only about an hour and a half away. And so we thought, well, we should at least start here to see if we can find fossils from this, you know, this critical interval of time. Like we wanted to go out and make a really big scientific discovery. And we really keyed in on this interval. Uh, people, been, you know, that interval being right after the extinction of the dinosaurs. People have been working on what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs for like, you know, the past 40, 50 years. And we had a really good understanding of what that was. And you heard that about that from Ian. But we knew nothing about what happened afterwards. Um, so we thought, well, this is where we could go and really have our, you know, make our scientific, um, you know, careers, if, if you will. And the Corral Bluffs is not by any means new to the scientific ballgame. Here's a picture of, of, uh, from a paper uh, by Roland Brown, who was at the Smithsonian from 1943. So folks have been going out here looking for fossils for at least around 100 years. Because again, this is such an interesting interval of time. It's Earth's last mass extinction. You have uh, you know, the extinction of the dinosaurs and the rise of the mammals. And so a lot of, there's been a lot of interest and a lot of effort that has go, gone into trying to figure out those complementary stories. And so we went out there um, hoping we could find some fossils. Um, our own museum, you know, so, so Smithsonian was out there in the 1940s and, and even earlier. Our own museum had been working there for at least the last 40 years. Uh, we, had a, we had a lot of volunteers, including one who I see has joined us today, Sharon Melito, who was going out there looking for fossils on behalf of the museum um, for really the last 15, maybe even 20 years. And, and, and certainly finding some things. Um, so we went out there to sort of join forces to see what we could find. And we went out there and we started finding some fossils. Um, you know, here is a, in my hand, two mammal jaws that prior to this discovery I'm gonna tell you about shortly, would have been an absolutely amazing discovery. You know, Ian talked about how I grew up in North Dakota and Montana. You know, those areas, they have rocks of the exact same age as at Corral Bluffs. And I found hundreds of dinosaurs below the boundary, but above the uh, KT boundary, I can count on one hand how many mammal jaws I've found, like the ones that, that are in my hand here. And, you know, it was pretty frustrating because Corral Bluffs isn't that big. And it seemed like at the time, you know, this is 2016, that we weren't going to find very many fossils. So this is going to be it. You know, so this is par for the course. This is what everybody else from around the world, this is what they find. But we had a couple of clues that suggested that there might be more at Corral Bluffs. Uh, Sharon Melito had found a partial skull of a, of a mammal, of, the, a large, of a large mammal. And that was an interesting find for me because I hadn't seen many fossils that were that complete from this interval of time. So while I'm out there looking for fossils and not really finding a whole lot and being incredibly underwhelmed by what I'm seeing, to be honest, I started thinking about that skull that Sharon had found, and I started to think about some of my experiences in South Africa. Uh, that's one of the places where I go and do field work. In there, they look not for bone like you see here, you know, bone weathering out on the ground. This is what we do pretty much everywhere here in North America. But rather there, they key in on a certain type of rock or a concretion. And then inside of those concretions are where the fossils are. So I thought, well, huh, maybe, maybe that'll, that's how we can find fossils here. And again, not really thinking that this would be the case, because I tried this technique in North Dakota and Montana and Wyoming and elsewhere throughout the American West. Um, but that is exactly what happened. We went out there. I picked up a, a concretion. I still remember the, the day. It was September of 2016, and I cracked it open. And there staring uh, back at me was a, was a complete mammal skull. Uh, it, it, absolutely an amazing experience for me, for Ian, as well as Sharon, who was out there at the time. These, these amazing fossils turned out that they were inside of these concretions. And here you can see just an animation of what a concretion is. 
And a concretion is just a rock. It's a type of rock that forms around an organic nucleus. And that organic nucleus, if you're really lucky, can be a mammal skull or some other type of vertebrate fossil. Um, think of like a, a pearl in, in an oyster shell. That's, that's a, a good analogy for what a concretion is. And I remember cracking that concretion open and just sitting down and just started, I just started laughing because it was just such an amazing moment. And Sharon came running over and Ian came running over and I was showing them this concretion and you know what was inside of this concretion because you could see I'd split the mammal skull right in half. And you know we were just like little kids out there just giggling on the outcrop. And uh, so I was there like busily taking care of the fossil and then Ian goes around the corner and comes carrying back a mammal skull. Sharon came back within 30 minutes and she had found a mammal skull. Once we knew that we should key in on this type of rock, it was an absolutely game changer for our ability to find fossils. We just started finding fossils everywhere. In that first week, year, even up until even today, we're still finding just absolutely amazing fossils. Um, and so here again, all of these fossils were just hiding out in plain sight because this is what they were in. I mean, you look at these and you look and think like, man, that just looks like a rock. And yet you're right, it is a rock, but it's a very special type of rock because inside of these concretions were whole mammal skulls, whole crocodile skulls, whole turtle shells, in some cases, entire turtles or mammals or, or uh, entire uh, crocodilian skeletons. And it was just absolutely amazing. Um, we, you know, over since 2016, we've been, when we made this discovery, we've been cleaning these concretions, which has revealed this whole lost ecosystem that was trapped, again, in, hiding in plain sight inside of these ugly concretions. And this is just a subset of the fossils that we found, a tiny subset, but it's really amazing because in this one image, we have new species of mammals, we have new species of crocodilians, we have new species of turtles. And not only that, but in every case of the, for the animals that we have, it might not be new to science, but it's the most complete specimen ever discovered of that particular uh, species. So, uh, pretty incredible. And I think with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to Ian. Thank you, Tyler. Okay. All right. Does that look good? I presume somebody yes, will does. let me know. Okay, yep, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so Tyler has um, given you some insight into how this discovery took place, and of course, the the sort of uh, moments of joy that we were able to um, uh, share on the outcrop as it was discovered. But science, as I think many of you know, doesn't happen in a bubble. And so, there's the two of us who are are scientists on this project, and of course, Sharon is one of our lead volunteers on all of this. But this takes a team of folks, and this is just a snapshot of some of uh, the team members. And in fact, we're probably up to about 50 scientists the world over working on this uh, discovery now, because of course, this is adding data to a moment in time for which virtually nobody had data to work with. So everybody's excited to try their tool or their technique or to add their thoughts about uh, what this discovery means and how it can tell us something about the origin of the modern world. So in addition to the vertebrates, um, there was the rest of the record. And that's, and that's sort of unusual. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, to start, we, we also had an incredible record of plants out there. And so there are many areas with records of plants. And in fact, plants had been known out there before. Uh, but this um, discovery of vertebrates really uh, brought the paleobotany team to bear. And we built a huge data set of plants to study how the forests and thus the ecosystems changed alongside the vertebrates. And so uh, as a paleobotanist, I'm one of about five on the team uh, that focus on the left there are fossil plant impressions on, on uh, slabs of sandstone. You can see some large leaves, probably relatives of modern figs. You might even be able to pick out a few bean pods and um, some palms, those fishtail looking like um, uh, 
uh, fossils there. And then we also looked at the micro side of the forest. So that's the macro side, the leaves, but there's also an incredible microscopic story that plays out in the rocks. And many of you, certainly me, have had uh, some allergies this fall. And what you're breathing in are all the pollen grains that the plants are producing um, all the time. And what we can do is take a chunk of rock about the size of a thimble and dissolve it. And inside that thimble sized chunk of rock, you might find as many as 100,000 pollen grains. And so on the panel on the, on the right, you see pollen grains that have been cleared and then dyed red. And on the bottom are Cretaceous. And you can see all the little Ks next to different types of, po of pollen grains. And the shapes are particular to the types of tree. And then above that, you see what we call the fern spike. And that's the moment after the extinction, after the asteroid impact, where the forests were wiped out and ferns are the first to recolonize. And you can see it's almost all spores of ferns, uh, besides a few other random things. And then the top, the paleogene, that's the recovery, some tens to hundreds of thousands of years later. Um, and you can now see all different kinds of shapes of pollen grains, representing a whole new forest uh, in that aftermath. So we brought that data to bear. Uh, we prepared a lot of these fossils, and it turns out it's extremely challenging to prepare these. And I'm going to show you a little time lapse here of, um, of a little tiny mammal skull coming out of the rock. And preparing this material off of these is actually quite challenging and takes me hundreds of hours. And there's just a few people around the world who can do it. And so these things get shipped out, and uh, people uh, prepare them and then ship them back to us. Uh, it's really quite uh, remarkable. And then um, that's sort of paleo the sort of standard paleontology. That's sort of the tool we've always had. We've had that tool for 100 or more years. But in the last decade or so, we've been able to not only prep these out and see the outside of them, but we can peer inside them and pull a whole or develop a whole new data set to sort of think about these animals in their environment. So here's Tyler at like 11 p.m. on a Friday night at the Wheat Ridge Animal Hospital with the tech. And what they're doing is they're sending uh, uh, fossils through the uh, CT scanner normally used for pets. And uh, they're a great partner and they're very kind to, to let us use this at night. And what they're doing is taking literally hundreds or thousands of x-rays, slices through, x-ray slices through this uh, um, fossil to be able to see inside. And then you take that data set back to a computer and you turn it into a 3D model. And so here's just an example of it. On the outside there, the grayed out area, that's the actual uh, a chunk of a skull. It's missing its nose, it's a little bit beat up, but it turns out this thing has incredible inner anatomy that we would not have otherwise seen. And what's highlighted there in sort of the teal is the brain cavity. And what's in purple on the left and right are the inner ears of this critter. So I'm gonna blow up just the colored area on this next slide, and here you go. So you can see the ears, the semicircular canals, and uh, a representation of the, uh, the brain uh, cavity of this uh, critter. And so we can use that to, when compared to modern critters to say a whole bunch of things. So this one in particular, given its, its, its encephalization, encephalization quotient, the, the size of its brain, was not very intelligent. Uh, maybe you didn't have to be very intelligent in the post uh, KT world. Has a very low agility score um, uh, based on its ears. It's very slow moving. And its olfactory bulbs up there towards the front are actually quite large, giving it the uh, um, uh, indicating to us that it had a remarkable sense of smell. So now you can start putting those pieces together and envision this critter in its environment. Um, I wanted to share one other kind of fun story of discovery, and that is um, uh, one that involves plants and it's near and dear to my heart, but it's really near and dear to our entire team, given how significant it was and just how discoveries sometimes play out. So when we discovered this, we knew that it was a huge deal. Tyler beautifully described um, just how overwhelming it was to us, and we immediately um, reached out to a film crew uh, working with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute or housed within the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And within days, they came and started documenting, documenting the discovery. And they were with us through most of the entire next three years. And so this is a moment some 18 months after discovery where we're trying to build up the fossil plant record. 
And so we're big, digging quarries and pulling out fossil plants, and we're trying to get that information to say something about the forest in which these critters live. And we run a program at the museum called the Teen Science Scholars, and we pay high school students who have a passion in science to work right alongside us all summer long, either in the field or in the lab, um, to see if they want to continue in science, and if they do, to help propel them into those fields. And this uh, young woman here on the left, her name's Aeon Way Smith, and she's about 14 in this photo, and she was one of our teen science scholars in 2017. Um, she was very, she's very quiet. She's not so much quiet anymore. She's, she's older and much more expressive, but she was then. She was one of our younger students. And Tyler and I had been talking about what kinds of things could drive the evolution of these mammals. We're seeing all these changes. Tyler's documenting all these changes in the animals. What could be driving it? And food sources could be a key aspect of that. And one of the key uh, sort of potential food sources on the landscape then had been hypothesized to be legumes, though nobody had ever found a legume fossil. The oldest legumes had been found in South America, but all this sort of inferences showed that they must be, their origins must be tied to the KT boundary at about that time. And Aeon, listening to us in the background, was sort of putting the pieces together, and she, um, uh, with a studious eye, found this fossil, and she was sort of pulling on my shirt while I was doing an interview, and I turned around, and I thought it was a stick, and she was like, no, no, look at it again, and I, it caught the light just perfectly, and I could tell that it was a bean pod. And in that moment, Le uh, uh, Aeon found the world's oldest legume, brought the origin of legumes from South America to North America, and helped us tell an incredible story of how these animals uh, were potentially co-evolving with the food sources on the landscape. And just to give you a sense of how important legumes are, there are 20,000 species of legumes today, and they're second only to cereals in terms of their food, their importance in terms of food to humanity. And here's the very first one ever found in the rock record anywhere on earth, and Aeon found it um, there in Colorado Springs in Corral Bluffs. And here's just another example of some of the uh, legume fossils. These are, um, we now have many examples of them. Because, uh, of course, once she found that first one, we, we dug everything out that we could find. And, of course, we still find them out there. Um, but she found the very first one. And so you can see some leaflets, the little tiny leaves, um, much like a locust tree, and the bean pods there on the left. And here's an artist's rendition of what we think this earliest bean may have looked like. Not unlike uh, the locust trees today. You can imagine those uh, here in the fall being, of course, bee brown uh, pods with nice yellowing leaves here as, as um, we go into winter. So uh, uh, before I hand it back to Tyler, I just want to uh, uh, make this point again and make it, maybe make it a little bit more strongly. That is that we not only had the vertebrate record, if you've gone anywhere in the world and found a vertebrate record like this, we would be excited. Um, now we've got that vertebrate, vertebrate record in the right time period, right after the time of the dinosaurs, so it's adding all kinds of new data. Uh, to this problem of how who survived and how they diversified and changed in that first uh, couple hundred thousand years. But what's remarkable is that we also had the plant record and the rocks were easy to date. That means that we were, e we were easily able to tell the time through the stack of rocks, which is not always the case. And so if you go anywhere in the world on at any given point in time, if you had two parts of this record, if you had the plants and the vertebrates or the plants and the time or the animals and the time, you would be thrilled. That would be really, you could say a lot. It wouldn't matter if it was right after an extinction. And um, if you had all three, you would be, you, you would have a gold mine with, again, regardless of where you were in the rock record, having all three together that you can tie this data together. And here in sort of this, uh, this moment that had previously been completely shrouded in mystery, we had all three. So it was, uh, we call this the trifecta of paleontology. So we had all three in this ultra important moment. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Tyler to finish this talk up. And uh, he's going to tie those three things together. Okay. I just love that story about Aeon and her uh, finding the legume. This, uh, this discovery is all about, I mean, this whole story is about amazing discoveries from, you know, Sharon's skull initially to cracking open that concretion to realizing that there are all these fossils were inside the concretion. And then, you know, of course, then uh, the legume. I think the, the discovery of that legume live on camera has to be one of my 
one of my all-time favorite, um, all, all-time favorite stories. So we made this amazing discovery from, you know, right in your guys' backyard. So what, what can it tell us? Uh, what does it say about the recovery of life after a mass extinction? Well, let's go back. This is what we knew before. We knew that, you know, we had the age of the dinosaurs down here, and we knew that at, at 66 million years or so ago, a giant asteroid struck her uh, and caused the Earth's uh, last mass extinction. And Ian told a wonderful story about, the, you know, that particular day. Um, this is the, the single worst day for life on Earth, you know, causing the extinction of, you know, almost instantaneously of 75% of life on Earth. And this is what we knew of what happened afterwards. We just didn't know a lot because the fossil record was just so incredibly poor. So now we have these amazing vertebrates. We have these amazing plants. The first thing that we needed to do was figure out the age of the rocks. And we had a whole team of scientists that worked with us on, on this, figuring out where our fossils were located relative to one another, and then how old the, uh, the rock was that, that encased our fossils. And we used a number of techniques, which we can talk about here, here at the end, but uh, it suffice to say that, is that we determined that we had the first 1 million years after the mass extinction. So we've, you know, we've down here labeled this as zero because this is the biologic reset button. And then we have the first 1 million years for the rise of the mammals and the origin of the modern world. And then the next thing, you know, we had this great vertebrate record. Uh, we started finding, you know, where once we only had teeth or jaws, now we have entire skulls and in some cases skeletons of these amazing uh, mammals. And there's a lot that we can do with that. I mean, Ian talked just a little bit about what we're able to do with the CT scanning the skulls and figuring out the size of the brain and the olfactory bulbs and their, their sense of balance from their inner, the semicircular canals. So that's all stuff that's ongoing right now, sort of the evolution of the mammalian brain. Um, it'll be a really important uh, paper and this discovery here will, will, will help fill in a lot of the gaps and, and it will help tell that story. So stay tuned on that. But the easiest thing that we can do when you have skulls like this is just figure out how big the animals are and when did they get big again? Um, so we can use the cranial size to determine body mass of these mammals. And body mass is so incredibly important in all aspects of an animal's ecology. It determines where it can live, um, you know, what it eats, and it's just so incredibly important. So we determined the body mass and then when the body mass changed. And so here we were able to plot that out. And so down here in the Cretaceous with the dinosaurs, we had mammals that are about the size of a raccoon. And then we were able to determine the largest mammal to survive the mass extinction was about half a kilogram or the size of a rat. And then we were able to see two big jumps in body size here at 300,000 years after the extinction and at 700,000 years after the extinction. And then this is where I really started to push Ian and the team of paleobotanists, you know, to tell me more about the environment in which these animals were living and evolving. Uh, because, you know, I really thought that these, these changes in body size would be related to the plants. You know, you are what you eat type of a thing. And so Ian and, and, and his team, they stepped up to the challenge and they collected several thousand uh, leaf fossils like he had showed, as you can see here again. We had a team of, 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 of palynologists, people who study fossilized pollen, and they counted several thousand, or hundred thousand pollen grains. Spent six plus months underneath of a microscope, uh, counting and categorizing the pollen from before and then just after the, uh, the mass extinction event. And all of this was to build this, this um, uh, to build up the ecosystems in which these ma mammals were evolving. And here we were able to, to we've broken it down into four worlds. We, we found that right after the mass extinction, there was a hyperabundance of ferns. Um, ferns are these pioneer plants. They're the first to come back after mass destruction. You know, like I think of like when a giant volcano erupts. Um, so right after this mass devastation, the first thing we see is the, the world blanketed in ferns. And then we see we, we, what we've dubbed the palm world, because after the, after the fern world, 
we start to see palm, these just uh, uh, palm trees and just uh, 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 taking over the landscape for up to about 300,000 years. And then at 300,000 years, the forests start to come back in terms of diversity. One of the key groups of plants that comes back are, is the walnut family and pecans are part of the walnut family. So we dubbed this the pecan pie world because in that exact instance, when the pecan or walnut family is starting to diversify, the forests are starting to come back, is when we see this jump in body size here at 300,000 years. So we think those two are, are intricately linked. And then finally, um, at uh, the next world and the last world that we named is the protein bar world, because this is where we get the very first bean pod, uh, Aeon's bean pod, the legume. Legumes are, of course, rich in protein. And so we dubbed this the protein bar world, because again, in that exact moment where we found the, the oldest legume, we find the largest mammals on the landscape. Also, with the plants, we we're also we we're able to infer paleo temperature. And I won't go into the details there. I'll let Ian answer any of those questions afterwards. But um, suffice it to say that by looking at the number of, of, of types of leaves that have little jagged margins versus the types of leaves that are smooth, you can infer the temperature. It works in the modern world, so it's a powerful tool for inferring paleo temperature. And we found that there were three distinct warming intervals after the mass extinction. And those warming intervals match up very nicely with these in jumps in body size here and here at 300,000 years and at 700,000 years. So we kind of have the whole picture here. We have the climate inferred from the leaves. The climate is influencing the evolution of the forest, just like it does today. And of course, the changing uh, forests are going to have a huge impact on the early uh, evolution of, of mammals. So it's, it's great you know, to have the, the climate, the vertebrates, the plants, and then all within a timeline to determine when these key transformations took place. So all of this allows us to paint these, you know, these uh, uh, visual hypotheses for what the landscape would have looked like and how that landscape changed uh, from the extinction of the dinosaurs through that first million years. So here's the, the first visual hypothesis that we have. And this is what Colorado would have looked like um, 66 million years ago. You would have had a lot of feathered dinosaurs, giant T-Rex, lots of other dinosaurs out on the landscape. 66 million years ago, giant asteroid strikes Earth, causes the extinction of the dinosaurs, as well as 75% of life on Earth. Again, it's the single worst day for life on Earth. But some things survive. And this is what the world would have looked like in, in the decades to centuries to few thousand years after the mass extinction. So here in the background, you have the Rocky Mountains, which are starting to uplift at this interval of time. The world was blanketed in ferns. You had little groves of palm trees sticking up here and there. But it was a very boring, low diversity type forest. And then in this illustration here, I've, I've, we've illustrated the largest mammal to survive the mass extinction. And that's this little rat-like animal that weighs about a half a kilogram. And then here's the largest animal, period, to survive the mass extinction. That's a giant soft-shell turtle uh, related to modern-day soft-shell turtles. And this turtle would have weighed several hundred pounds. Then the next thing that we would see in Colorado, in, in uh, Colorado Springs, was the forest starting to come back a little bit. Uh, mainly by uh, a hyperabundance of palms. Palms in the understory, palms in the overstory, just a lot of palms uh, during the first 300,000 years after the mass extinction. And in this understory, uh, palm understory forest, the mammals start to come back. They start to come back both in diversity as well as body size. So here you can see a, a mammal that's much larger than a rat. This is about the size of a raccoon. And this mammal appears about 100,000 years after um, the mass extinction event. And this is the same size mammal as before the mass extinction. So it only takes 100,000 years for mammals to achieve the same body mass as before the mass extinction, That's, which is quite remarkable. 
Then at 300,000 years, the forests are really starting to, to, to come back in terms of diversity. And one of the main groups that comes back is the, the uh, walnut family, as you can see here, some walnut uh, uh, flowers as well as uh, leaves. And that includes pecans. So again, we gave this the, the nickname as the pecan pie world, because in this pecan pie world, mammal diversity continues to take off but more importantly, you get a much, you get a, a, a big jump in body size. Mammals going to about 35 times larger than those that survived the mass extinction. And then the last world is the protein bar world at 700,000 years after the mass extinction. The forests continue to bounce back. You get the appearance of the world's oldest legumes or bean pods. And here you can see a, a mammal, Tinea labus, chewing on a bean pod. And at this interval, we get the largest mammals um, that we've discovered in our, in our, in, in, from uh, Corral Bluffs. And these mammals weigh well over 100 pounds. They're a hundred times larger than the mammals that survived the mass extinction. A hundred times within 700,000 years. Uh, a comparable increase in body size won't occur for another 35 million years. So all of this speaks to the rapidity of, of the recovery, of ecosystem recovery after, you know, the single worst day for life on Earth. So, you know, this was a dream come true for, for myself as well as for Ian. We were able to publish this uh, discovery in one of the best scientific journals uh, uh, called Science. We worked with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to create a one-hour uh, NOVA Doc, or a one hour documentary um, that was aired on PBS Nova, which if you haven't watched it, you should definitely go on, on, on PBS's website and check it out. They do an incredible job of telling this discovery. They joined us from the day we made the discovery till the moment that we published it. And so it's, I think, a great, a great way to tell this story. And then finally, we worked with museum professionals at our own institution at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to put together an exhibit um, that shows the most amazing fossils that we found out at Corral Bluffs. And then just really, again, does a great job of telling this incredible discovery story. So you know, kind of a hard thing to beat, you know, having a big paper and then right on the heels of that, having a one hour documentary and an exhibit opening all within the same week. Um, truly incredible. So with that, I think I'm going to, or I would like to play a one minute clip uh, sort of a highlight reel from the documentary which really does a great job um, just showing the discovery and just uh, how excited we were and how, how much of a big big deal it really was so here we go it's a really bad time for life on earth I mean, you could go your entire career and not find a skull from this time period. That's how rare they are. They are excruciatingly hard to find. There's just nothing like picking up something and finding out it's something amazing. It was crazy the way it happened. Bam, we, uh, we hit a big. I just found a mammal skull. <laughs> It was like opening a door into a new world. We want to build up a picture of how life evolved at this period. Some things survive, right? Including some of our earliest, earliest ancestors. Over the last 66 million years, mammals evolved an incredible diversity of forms. That moment of rapid mammal evolution is effectively the trigger to our existence here on planet Earth. Okay, well, I think if we have time, Ian and I can uh, now entertain any questions that you guys might have. 
thanks thanks for tuning in yes thank you both so much i went ahead and posted the full length um or the full link to the nova documentary um, in the chat function as well so folks can watch that so we do have a few questions and please forgive my um I can't pronounce some of these things, so I apologize. Um, but Rose asks, can you please tell me more about the eoconodon? Is it an omnivore? <laughs> Is that totally off? <laughs> no, you nailed it. That's the Did point. I? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, she what, Based off of the teeth, she says it looks like more of a carnivore. So she's curious about what that would have um, eaten. Yeah, so the reason I laugh is just that's very specific, you know, I, which I love. I love these very, you know, detailed questions just like that. Eocon, Eoconodon crypheus, which is uh, uh, my favorite mammal that we found out there. Um, so yeah, is it an omnivore? It seems like it is an omnivore, but it has more of a carnivorous diet. So like there, of course, it's a spectrum, right? All omnivores, they eat both plants and animals. And some omnivores eat more plants, some omnivores eat more meat. And Again, just like you pointed out there, Rose, I mean, the teeth on that thing, especially on the front, uh, look like they were, you know, were well-tuned for eating flesh, uh, for eating meat. If you look at the teeth in the back, though, those teeth are pretty broad and pretty flat, um, much like modern-day herb uh, herbivores. Think of like a cow or a, or a deer. Um, and so we do think it was an omnivore, but because of those big pointed teeth in the front of its mouth, we do think that it had was probably more carnivorous than herbivorous. And we're going to be continuing to work on that. We, we have students at, uh, uh, I should say, at the University of Boulder or University of Colorado in Boulder that are looking that's looking at bite force of these animals. And it turns out Eoconodon had a really powerful bite. Uh, and so this student, she's presenting some of that work at the upcoming Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting uh, here like next week or in two weeks. So it's an ongoing question and a great question. Amy's curious about how the leaves correlate with temperature. Yeah, uh, great question. So um, uh, actually, if you're, if you're uh, very interested in this, I actually gave a talk on Thursday, just two days ago on this and it's on Facebook. If you go to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science Facebook page, there's a 10 minute talk uh, with some graphs and some images that, that highlight uh, how we tell temperature using fossil plants. Um, but the idea is, is that if you go to a for any forest on earth, if it has enough um, flowering trees, so angiosperms, um, that uh, uh, we call their woody dicotyledonous trees, so you may know that if you've got some botany background or you know that term. But basically the percentage of species that have toothed margins or serrate margins compared to the percentage of species that have smooth margins correlates to the annual temperature. And the teeth are playing a function in um, uh, uh, bud burst and uh, are related to, there are more teeth and more tooth species in colder climates to probably uh, incentivize or to stimulate growth early in the season uh, because the growth, the season is, is, sh is shorter as you get into colder climates. If you go to the Amazon, of course, it's the same temperature all year round and uh, most species have smooth margins. And even though it's not a direct link to temperature, we think that we, well, it's an observation, we've known it for maybe a hundred years that uh, you can go out and count the species of tooth leaf leaves and the number of species with mar uh, entire leaves and figure out the annual temperature of a forest of a forest today and so we can take that information and apply it to the rock record and go basically collect all the fossils out of a single hole in the ground that is a proxy for some window into the forest sort them into species figure out which ones are entire and which ones are smooth and then figure out what the mean annual temperature was it's one of our main tools and in paleobotany, but that's that's the the premise, and we applied that uh, technique in this data set, and we're able to tease out those warming intervals that Tyler talked about. Thank you. Um, there is a question about um, the seeds and their ability to survive in a superheated atmosphere. Do we know how that happened? Yeah, how did the seeds survive? Well, um, soil is, is really an incredible insulator. So it only takes a few centimeters, maybe eight or 10 centimeters of soil 
to um, be insulate you against air temperature. So um, if you are somewhere, you know, maybe in a deep valley or the soil is incredibly moist or something like that, this intense thermal pulse that happened probably only lasted an hour or two um, because since it was hot everywhere on earth, the ocean started to evaporate and it brought that temperature down, we think quickly. I mean, this is all um, a modeling at some level, but we do know that some did survive, right? So a thick, you know, seed coat, maybe buried in a little bit of soil, maybe some moisture involved, and you could survive a couple of hours in a, in a hot oven, basically. So that's, that's the thought. Joyce wanted to know, is that exciting moment um, of the legume discovery shown in the documentary with the student? It absolutely is, so yeah. Great. Let's see here. Um, Rose wanted to share that, of course, um, the public can tour Corral Bluffs. It looks like you have to schedule a hike. So super exciting that there is an ability to visit. Um, you just go to corralbluffs.org, and she actually shared that link in the chat um, to schedule that. And the Cool Science Festival, which actually starts today, um, is also doing, it sounds like, some guided hikes uh, connected to Corral Bluffs with the Alliance. So a lot of exciting opportunities to learn more. And then a final question we have here, are there plans to expand the current exhibit at DMNS? Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> um, there are no plans to, to expand, but we are always moving new items out onto the floor. Um, we've also had other museums that are interested in that particular exhibit. Um, the goal of that exhibit was not to be permanent. It was supposed to be out on the floor for only six months to, to a year. It'll likely be out for a little bit longer. Um, of course, everything uh, is up in the air. It's 2020, so who knows <laughs> what's, uh, what's going to happen, what's around the corner, but, uh, but uh, no plans to, to at least to expand it. Well, we are about at 3 p.m. I want to thank you both for your time. That was so interesting. Um, on behalf of the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, again, want to mention that our final lecture of 2020 is scheduled for November 14th at 2 p.m., Colorado Springs Archaeological Past. So we hope you'll come back and join us for that wonderful presentation. So thank you both. I hope everyone has an excellent weekend. Um, yeah, thank you again. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.